It was probably about 10 years ago where the thought actually hit me. I would say that this thought has hit most of you at some time in your life. I was driving down the interstate and I was going all about 70 miles an hour and I looked in front of me and there was a huge tractor trailer that had square bales of hay on the back of it and it had basically three sections and they were strapped down and it looked like they were strapped down pretty good. But as I was driving, it was probably 50 yards in front of me. And in my mind, I thought, I sure hope those hay bales don't. And you know, right about the time I got mentally to the word don't, I saw the entire section from the back of that trailer of those hay bales falling into the interstate. Now, I had been making up some room between me and the truck, and you're looking at maybe 20 yards. I'm going about 70 miles an hour, and there is no possible way that I can stop. And the thought dawns on me, Kyle, this, this could be your last moment of life. This could be it. You know, they say just before you die sometimes or just before you get close to dying that your life flashes in your mind before you and you see scenes of when you were a child and scenes of when you were growing up. You know, I, I didn't see any of that. In fact, all I saw was hay. And that hay came at me about 70 miles an hour. Bam! My car hit that hay and, well, well I thought I was going to die. But I didn't. It just so happens that when you've got a small SUV going 70 miles an hour into a bunch of square bales of hay, that it basically just blows the hay up. And, and I didn't die that day, but I remember thinking, I I'm going to die. My life is getting shorter and shorter, and that reminded me of a fact that we all know, but we don't like to bring to the forefront of our minds, and that is just simply the truth. Life is short. You see, we don't like that thought because we kind of think that it's a morbid thought. We think that it's something that is depressing, something that we should put behind us. But I think you and I both understand that we can't live the kind of full, exciting, fulfilled life that we need to live until we get comfortable with the idea that we are dying, that life is short. You know, it might surprise you to understand that God, the creator of all humans, has written a book for us, the Bible, and in that book, He constantly reminds us that our life is short. And He gives us lots of word pictures that help us understand just how short human life is. For instance, if you were to go to the New Testament, in the New Testament book of James, James writes to his readers and to us about the brevity of life and the uncertainty of life. And this is what he says in chapter 4, verse 13 and following. He says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a city and spend a year there and buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know, in this very uncertain time that we're in, right now there are Lots of things going on with the coronavirus. There are lots of things that have been canceled, lots of trips that we are not making. I dare say that many of you who are watching this, you had plans for what you were going to do this summer, plans for what you were going to do maybe in the fall or what you were going to do this spring, and those plans just simply came to an end with the social distancing that we have been put under and with the governmental regulations well, things have come to a stop in many ways. And it almost is like God through James is talking directly to us in this time of uncertainty, in this time of plans that have been taken away and we are somehow just kind of in a, a lull. And it's almost like we had plans. We were going to go into this place and we were going to do this and that. But hold on just a second. What we need to remember is we don't know what's going to happen 
tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even like a vapor. That idea of a vapor. You know, lots of times I think of a little mist coming off of some water, or uh, especially when you get some coffee, and that coffee is steaming hot, and maybe it's a cold day outside, and you have that cup of coffee, and you walk outside, and because of the heat of that coffee, that steam is coming up out of the top of that cup, but, you know, that steam, that vapor only lasts for about four or six inches, and the time that it's there is just a few seconds and then it vanishes away. You see, that's what God is trying to remind us of, the fact that our lives are short, that our lives are coming to an end. And at first you think, well, well, that just seems like a negative thought, but when we start looking at music and media and various different outlets for people who have given us profound thoughts, you know that idea of life being short is one of the most profound and inspirational thoughts that we will see in any type of media outlet or song or anything of that nature. In fact, some of the most memorable songs have that as the theme. If you're a country music fan, maybe you listened to Tim McGraw several years ago as he sang the song, Live Like You're Dying. And in that song, the story was about a, an older individual who went to the doctor and he realized he had cancer. And he was talking to this younger man, and the younger man was asking him, when you found out you only had a short time to live, what did you do? Well, in the chorus of that song says, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu, I loved deeper and I spoke sweeter, and I finally gave forgiveness I had been denying. And then the irony of the last line of the chorus is, he says, and son, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you're dying. Well, of course, he didn't mean, I hope you get the chance to have some terminal illness or some sickness that you know your time is short. But he said, I want you to grasp this profound truth that in order to live the fullest life that you were designed to live here on this earth, you have to get comfortable with. You have to get familiar with. You have to understand that your life, my life, the life of all human beings is short. And when we grasp that fact, well, we live fuller, more robust, more spiritually powerful lives than if we push that idea to the back of our minds. Chris Allen wrote a song that basically had the same title, Live Like We're Dying. He actually sung it. It was written by someone else. And in this song, he said, we've got 86,400 seconds in a day to turn it all around or throw it all away. We've got to tell them that we love them while we have the chance to say, because we've got to live like we're dying. It's interesting as you continue to explore what God says in the Bible about living like you're dying. There's a very interesting psalm. It's Psalm 90. Now, what's interesting about Psalm 90 is that the bulk of the psalms there in the Old Testament are written by David. David lived in about 1000 B.C., and he wrote about 70, 73 of the psalms or so, and then many of the other psalms were written by men who lived about the same time as David. But Psalm 90 is a very different psalm, and it was written by Moses. Now what's interesting about that is that Moses was living about 450 years before David lived. And this particular psalm was preserved to be put in the book of Psalms for 450 years or so. And when you get to Psalm 90, you start in verse 1, and then you go to verse 2, and Moses is talking about the longevity of God's life and existence. And there in verse 2 he says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, he's talking about God and he's saying, when you look at the 
lifespan of God. You can't even really use the word lifespan because it's not like it ever had a beginning. It's not like it ever comes to an end. God was before anything was ever created. God will be after everything in this physical world is burned up and there is a new situation. It will be God from everlasting to everlasting. He's always been. He's been through every human generation and will be till the end of physical time on this earth. But then he starts comparing human life to that life or that existence of God. And you get down to about verse 10 and Moses says, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What happens when we number our days? What happens when we start to realize our lives are short and we need to use them in a way that will fill each second, each minute, each day with the most important things? Well, Moses explains to us that we will gain a heart of wisdom. And notice he says, you know, generally speaking, the lifespan of an average person is 70 years. If by reason of strength and you've got a good diet and you have good health, you might live to be 80 years old. But isn't 80 years even a short time period compared to God who from everlasting to everlasting? And what I find very interesting is how quickly time seems to go as we grow older every single day. Now I... 16 years ago, had my first child. My wife gave birth to our first child, and, and he's 16 years old now, and it seems like just... You could fill in the blank, couldn't you? Seemed like just yesterday. And I was talking to my mother, who is my 16-year-old son's grandmother, and she said, Kyle, if you think your life is going fast now, just wait. Well, a 35-year-old talks to a 45- or 50-year-old, and that... 50-year-old says, well, if you think your life is going fast now, you just wait. And then that 50-year-old talks to a 65-year-old, 65 65-year-old, and that 65-year-old says, if you think your life is going fast, well, you just wait. And that 65-year-old is talking to an 80-year-old, and that 80-year-old says, if you think your life is going fast now, at what point does a person say, boy, life is just going so slow? It just doesn't happen, does it? You see, because we might live to be 70. We might live to be 80. But our lives are still short. And when we get that idea in our mind firmly and we're comfortable with that, it doesn't bother us. We see our death coming. It might be today. It might be 10 years from now. Moses is saying, you know, you might live to be 70. It might be 60 years from now or 70 years from now. But still, at the end of it, we're going to die. And if we'll number our days, that will give us a heart of wisdom. Well, what does he mean number our days? As I understand it, the picture here is one of something like a prisoner. Maybe in your mind you can picture it. I picture it maybe in a cartoon or an old movie. You have somebody that's kind of in a dungeon-like scene and somehow they've found a very sharp piece of rock and they have gotten that piece of rock and maybe they're going to be there they know for a year and they're going to to tick off the 365 days that they're going to be in there. So that first day they put one mark there on the side of the wall, and that next day they put another one and another one, and that fifth day they put one of those diagonal marks, and so they've got those five marks that go down the wall, and it's 5, 10, 15, 20. And they're counting the days until they get out of prison. Well, that's the picture here. Moses is saying we need to number our days. We need to count them. Well, count them until what, Moses? Well, count them until, well, not until we get out of prison, but count them until it's our time to leave. You know, and in this time of crisis and this time of thinking about the COVID-19 virus, what's very interesting to me is that Moses wrote this psalm during the wandering of the children of Israel in the wilderness. Now, I don't know if you know that story. Maybe you do. 
God had promised the Israelites the land of Canaan. And when they came out of Egypt and God had miraculously delivered them, they came to the border of the land of Canaan and they sent 12 spies into the land to see if it was like God had said it was. And of course it was. And they spent 40 days wandering around in Canaan looking at everything. And it truly was a land flowing with milk and honey. That was a phrase that just simply meant it was an abundant land filled with wonderful things to eat and it was well watered and it was going to be a great place to live. But the spies, they brought back the text as a bad report because they said, yeah, it's a great land, but it swallows up its inhabitants and the people there are giants and there's no way we could take them. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Well, and then because of their disobedience to God and their lack of faith, God says that you're going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. And he says that every person who is 20 years old and above is going to die in the wilderness. Now, the Bible gives you some numbers for how many Israelites there were that came out of the land of Egypt. It talks about the men who were 20 years old and above that were fighting age that could go into an army. And there were about 680,000 of them. And so you had about that many women as well. So you had about 1.5 million people that were all going to die in the wilderness in the next 40 years. Well, if you start doing the math on that, you realize that on average, about 95 people every single day were dying in the wilderness wandering. You know, that's about the death rate of what we've got going with the COVID virus right now, except the difference is that's worldwide. About 100 to 105 people at the present are, are dying every single day of the coronavirus. But you're talking about one group of people that only numbered about 1.5 million to 2 million, and they were losing about 95 to 100 people every single day on average. It was like for 40 years they were in the middle of a pandemic. You think about 100 funerals a day in a group of people that numbered about 1.5 million. Do you think Moses was very comfortable with, or maybe a better term should be, do you think he understood death very well? You know, I find it very interesting that in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses tells us when he is writing Deuteronomy. Here's what he says. He says, I'm writing this text in the 11th month. What's he trying to say? The 11th month? Moses is explaining, I have one month to live. Do you think Moses knew about numbering his days? Do you think as that time drew to an end, and as you look at the story of Moses, you realize that he didn't get to go into the promised land because there was a time when God instructed him to do something that Moses just simply did not do any rebelled against God's command. And he was going to be one of those that died in the wilderness, wasn't going to get to go over to the promised land. So he knew when he was writing the book of Deuteronomy, he had a month to live. If we knew we had a month to live, would we rearrange our lives so that we did the things that were the most important? Oh, I think absolutely we would. In fact, I think we would understand that when we have a limited time, you know, maybe we should say when we realize and keep in our mind that we have a limited time, because we've always just got a limited time. But when we get that thought in a way that it is a constant reminder, well, then we live more full, complete, more spiritually powerful, beneficial, better lives. It's just a fact. You know, as you look in the Bible for other word pictures of the brevity of life, God constantly gives us reminders of this fact just over and over and over. You go to the book of Job, and in Job chapter 7, you look at verse 6, and Job says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. 
Now, a lot of us, if you're like me, we haven't seen a lot of looms and we haven't seen a lot of weavers shuttles. That was a machine and there was something on the loom that went back and forth. And if it was a person who was very good at weaving, then that shuttle went back and forth so fast you could almost not even see it. Now, I remember as a child, my grandmother would do some knitting and I would be sitting on the couch with her and she'd be talking to me about what was going on at school that day or something. And she had those two needles and she would just click those two needles. I remember that little aluminum clicking sound that they would make. And they were going so fast and her ball of yarn would be getting smaller and smaller and the blanket or afghan or whatever it was she was making would be getting bigger and bigger. And I remember just thinking how fast her hands were moving. Just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Just imagine how quickly those fingers were moving that my grandmother was making that fast. That's how our lives are going. Well, Job gives us another picture just a couple chapters later in Job chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. He says, Now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They pass like swift ships, like an eagle swooping at its prey. Swifter than a runner. You know, I think it's very interesting. The fastest man in the world title that is often given to the person who does the 100 meter dash in the fastest time. Right now, currently, the man who is holding that record is Hussein Bolt, and he has run it in 9.58 seconds. He's gone 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. Now, what I think is interesting about that is when the Olympics come on every four years and you get to see these races, lots of times this 100 meter dash is the one that is touted as something you need to watch and they talk about all the people who might give the leader a run for his money, no pun intended there, and they talk about this person from this country might, and they, they talk about it for days and days before the event. And then the event is about to happen. But you know, if, if you happen to get up out of your chair and go to your refrigerator or somewhere else in your house and get something to drink and you get back, well, it might be that you miss the whole race because the race is only 9.58 seconds and all that talk about it and the race is over. That's what Job's saying. Our lives are faster than a runner. If you were to think of the fastest man in the world, and from the time that that gun sounds to the less than 10 seconds that that race is over, that was our life. They're that fast. Well, what happens when we start internalizing the fact that life is short? We gain a heart of wisdom. What if you knew right now, for a fact that in 24 hours you would be physically dead. Your soul would leave this body and you would no longer be here in this world. What if you knew that for a fact? I don't know what time you are watching this where you are, but if you were to look at a clock and you were to say 24 hours from this moment I will be dead. What would that realization spur you to do? You know, some people who basically have taken the easy way out and just given up on life say, well, that would mean I would just party and I would just try to get the most out of my last 24 hours that I could. I might go drinking or I might get some type of illegal substance. And, you know, Paul talks about that in the New Testament and he talks about people who say, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Some people take that approach, but you know that's only the approach that a a non-thinking person would take, only the approach that a person who's not serious about what life really means would take. Now, I don't think that's you, and the reason for that is I don't think you'd be watching this program if you didn't have some type of desire to understand the reality and importance of life. So what if? 23 hours, 58 minutes you have left. You know, would you feel like you needed to binge watch that Netflix show because you've seen the first three seasons, but the last two you haven't seen, so you'd need to spend 10 hours or so of the remaining 24 getting to the end of that? You know, I don't think so. 
Would you feel like you need to spend a couple hours on Facebook scanning through to see what so-and-so is doing and how that relates to your life and how they're taking more trips than you or not as many as you? Now, I don't think that's what we'd be doing. You know, wouldn't it be the case that we'd start to be thinking about what we feel like is the most important? Maybe we would start to think about people that we need to get right with. You know, it might be the Oh, the 25, 30-year-old who has felt like they haven't been the kind of daughter, haven't been the kind of son that they should have been to their parents. Maybe, maybe they would give that parent, that mother, that father a call and say, you raised me right. You taught me great things, but I, I didn't listen to what you said. I know that you provided for me physically and you provided for me spiritually and you taught me what I needed to do, but I turned away from your teachings and I'm sorry. I didn't respect you like I should. Mom, you've given me so much and I just want to apologize. You know, it might be, and I've seen this, where a parent later in their life understood the importance of kindness and following the example of Jesus Christ and the teachings in the Bible, but they didn't understand that as they were rearing children. And sometimes they were even abusive to those children, either physically or emotionally. And they've never really faced the fact that that's how they responded to their children. And it might be that that father, who maybe was addicted to some type of alcohol or substance abuse during his children's growing up period, might need to call his daughter or his son and say, you know, I didn't treat you right. I did things to you that I never should have done, and I beg your forgiveness for that. Could be the case. But when we start thinking about life, and its brevity, we realize that if I only had, if I only had 23 hours and 57 minutes left, I would, well, maybe it's, I would get my life right with the people around me. Maybe it's, and I think this is absolutely the case, that any thinking person, any reasonable person realizes, you know, in, in just 24 hours, I'm going to meet my Creator. Am I ready for that? reality. I'll tell you a story that I was told at, at the university where I went. There was a professor who was very evangelistic and he loved Christ and loved the forgiveness that would come with obedience to Christ's plan of salvation. And he tried to teach as many people as he could the reality of sin and how they could get into Christ and have Christ's perfect sacrifice covering them of their sin. And this particular individual he was talking to, and this young man came into the university setting and wasn't really thinking all that much about his soul, but, but the professor asked him if he wanted to study the Bible. And this young man said he would. And so they studied and talked about how to get into Christ and how a person believes in Jesus as the Son of God, confesses that belief publicly, willing to repent of their sins, and ultimately willing to give themselves over to God and... God then gives them the free gift of salvation when they obey His commandment to be immersed in water baptism for the forgiveness of those sins. And that young man understood it completely, but just never really wanted to act on it. In fact, he graduated after several studies and work with the professor. He graduated knowing what he needed to do to become a Christian, but just wouldn't do it. And soon after he got out of college, the university there, he was in a tragic accident where literally a, a truck backed over him and broke several of his bones and he ended up on a construction site where he was literally about to die and the first thing that came to his mind was you need to call this professor because I need to become a Christian. And so they called this professor and he came down to the construction site and he wasn't able to baptize him at that point and they put this young man on the stretcher, put him in the ambulance and didn't know if he was going to make it. But they got him to the hospital and he started doing better and started progressing after a day or two. And my professor, who was also just a preacher at a congregation down the road, kept going to visit him and visiting him after second day and third day and second week and the third week. And he was getting better and better. And the whole time, my professor was talking to him about his soul, which was the first thing he wanted to discuss when he thought his life was almost over. But then, as the young man got better and better, he started wanting to discuss his spiritual condition less and less, and he was released from that hospital and never did 
obey the gospel, never became a Christian. When he thought he only had a few minutes left, the first thing on his mind, I've got to get right with my Creator. When he thought he had years and years and years to go, he pushed it to the very back of his mind. Lord, teach us to, to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, I think this story is probably one of the best illustrations of this truth that I have seen. It's a story that, that you will see on the internet and other places about a young man who was out in his garage. He was a ham radio operator. And he was dialing in to hear what was going on on the radio that Saturday morning. And he said he stopped on this older gentleman's voice. And this older gentleman had a kind of a golden voice that just captivated you and it drew you in. And he said he stopped and he started listening to this older gentleman who was talking to a younger man. And the younger man had just told how he got a new job. And this new job was going to well keep him away from his family for many, many hours of the week. He was going to be working 60 or 70 hours every week, and he was going to be spending less time with his family, but he was going to, he was going to have an a increased salary, and he was going to get to climb the corporate ladder. Well, the older man said, you know, I, I don't know about all of that, but he said, I'll tell you what happened to me. Several years ago, he said, it dawned on me that my life is short. And what I mean by that is someone was discussing this with me and I realized that, you know, you've got 52 Saturdays every single year. And each one of those is, is the only Saturday you've got that year. And I was about 55 years old at the time. And he said, I understood that I might live to be 75 years old. And I was about 55 or so at the time. So I calculated how many Saturdays I had. And it came out to about 1,000. And he said, I went down to the local toy store, and I bought 1,000 marbles, and I put them in a clear plastic container in my shop there in the garage, and every Saturday from the time I've been 55 or so until now, I have taken one of those marbles out and thrown it in the garbage. He said, and as I started seeing my life represented in those marbles dwindling, well, I started doing the things that were the most important in my life, spending time with the ones I loved and making sure I was filling my time with the most important, most valuable thing. But today, I reached into that container and I pulled out the last marble. I said, I don't know how much more time I have left. Any more Saturdays are just a bonus. But I hope that you will understand your life to be limited and spend your time doing the most important things with the time that you have left. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom.